You know, uh, working with uh, Greg Jackson's camp in, in Albuquerque, you know, from time to time you'll have an opponent uh, like Santiago come up where maybe you've had some camp mates uh, uh, take on that opponent in the past. I know uh, Joey Villasenor has, has fought him. Does it does that sort of thing matter if enough time has passed? I think their fight was like six years ago. You know, is there is there any actual uh, information that can be derived from something like that? No, you know, there really isn't. There, there's just normally yes. But in this case, it's been so long ago. I mean, that was before I was even before I even thought about fighting. Right, so, right. you know, George has changed so much since then, and it's really even hard to. I, I didn't even bother watching his UFC fights from, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when he was first in the UFC because I think those are so dated. He's a completely different fighter now. Uh, he's a multiple-time world champion. So, you know, he's a guy who came to the UFC to fight Anderson Silva. Uh, that's who he won. Fight. He won an immediate title shot. And instead, you know, the UFC gave him me because Anderson Silva's already matched up. So uh, it's a great opportunity for me. This is a win-win situation, and, and I'm not going to miss my chance to capitalize on it. Now, for those who don't know uh, your background, Brian, you come from an uh, 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 active military background, uh, decorated Marine. And, in fact, uh, for a time, you were actually still, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess active duty is the right term, uh, while you're, you're fighting and you're using, uh, you know, leave days to do your fights and that sort of thing. And I was, I was thinking uh, about, you know, the fact that you've cut down from light heavyweight to middleweight. And I, I noticed on your Twitter feed you were talking about the weight cut and everything. Uh, for those who don't know what the, the active military lifestyle is like, I'm assuming you were probably pressed for time at certain points when you were managing both, and, you know, there's a, maybe a, a, a certain diet that's provided by the military that maybe is a little different than what you're eating now. Would that sort of thing have been possible back when you were juggling both, uh, if, if you had to make a big weight cut like that, or would it have just not been practical? Well, you know, I, I think I still could have made the weight cut depending on – I would have had to really take a look at the scheduling of my fight and ensure that uh, it wasn't a time where being an infantry officer that I wasn't out in the field training because we go out to the field from Monday all the way through Friday. Mm. It wasn't going to be a time where we were going to be leaving to do some off-site exercises in the desert in 29 Palms or, you know, different bases that we go to where basically you don't have an opportunity to train at all and you're just eating MREs, which are the meals, you know, that, that come ready to eat. Yeah. Uh, provided by the Marine Corps. So, um, you know, it, it would have been very, very difficult. And, and there's just no way I'd be able to compete against this level of competition uh, while I was on active duty because simply uh, I just had too much time that I had to put into my Marines. You know, when I was competing I was active duty, I would get to the gym at 5 a.m. to get my first workout in before I got to work at 6 a.m. Then I would go back to the gym at 6.30 p.m to train again to do my technical training for two hours, and then I'd go home to my wife and new daughter. Wow. <laughs> so my schedule was ridiculous, and there was, you know, there were times where I took fights and I really only trained for a week because I had different field exercises, et cetera. There's no way I could compete against this level of competition doing that. Yeah. It's just it's impossible. You know, This is the highest level of the sport. This is the NFL of mixed martial arts, and um, anybody I fight is going to be top 30 in the world for the weight class. So... Uh, it, it, it was imperative if I was going to continue doing this at this level that I'd be able to do it full-time and train like a full-time athlete. Let's talk about your uh, recent fight against Chris Lieben. Uh, you know, for those who didn't follow you as the light heavyweight champion in, in WEC, coming over to the UFC and then making uh, the weight cut down to, uh, to middleweight, uh, you know, up to that point, that Lieben fight was, uh, you know, was, was the biggest marquee matchup I think you had had to a mainstream MMA audience. And, you know, you, you asked for that fight and stopped Chris Lieben uh, on strikes only the second time in his career. You've got the uh, – you share the rare distinction with Anderson Silva as being one of only two guys that had done that. You know, I, I watched that fight again knowing I was going to be talking to you, and I wanted to ask you about that moment where – you drop Lieben on strikes. I mean, a lot of people thought maybe you weren't even going to try to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lieben. You drop him on strikes, and he gets back up, and you've got him in that standing guillotine for a moment before you finally finish him. There looked to be a moment there where you sort of take a deep breath, and, and I'm wondering if there's not a moment in the cage where you think, wow, that guy just took a really hard shot, and now he's back on his feet. I've got to finish him. Where do I go from there? I mean, take me inside that thought process. Sure. Well, actually, you know, I, I remember the exact moment. You're right. There was a moment there, but it, it certainly wasn't kind of discouragement or me yeah. saying, oh, wow, you know, he just took my best shot. We actually trained to that. 
So in my sparring rounds, we would have some of my sparring rounds or sparring partners pretend like uh, they were hurt. Hmm. And, you know, to get me to make sure that, okay, I'm, I'm used to a guy stumbling a bit and being controlled. And the game plan was when we hurt him because we knew it was going to happen, attack his body and attack his legs because, you know, hmm. Chris in the head doesn't necessarily do much to be, you know, to be quite honest, we've seen you know him eat shots and just knock people out, and he's most dangerous when he's hurt. But I don't care who you are; when you get hit in the body, it will affect you. And so, uh, you know, the big key was not to try and not wear yourself out, not gas yourself out, trying to get a knockout and trying to force a knockout every time you hurt him. If you hurt him, great, just go right back to the game plan, business as usual, because this is a guy who's been there before and a guy who's most dangerous when he's hurt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, in the aftermath of that fight, there was some talk about you fighting Vanderlei Silva, speaking of legendary names. And it was Vanderlei who didn't want to take that fight because he felt like, you know, he's kind of he's definitely a, a beloved figure in, in the UFC. And I guess he felt like uh, because you were so popular yourself, a legitimate American hero, that he kind of maybe didn't want to play the de facto bad guy to your good guy. I'm thinking on the one hand, that's got to be flattering, but maybe on the other hand, it's got to be frustrating because, I mean, what, a, what a, uh, a bullet point for your career to have a fight one way or another against Vanderlei Silva. What were your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, it was one of those things where, one, I don't think you can compare at all the popularity of Vanderlei Silva to me. So, uh, you know, when Vanderlei was comparing that, I think he was way off because for every, you know, one Brian Stan fan, there's probably 5,000 Vanderlei Silva fans. He's an international superstar. I, I'm nowhere near that level yet. And, uh, you know, I knew it was a long shot when I asked to fight him in the first place. Vanderlei's a guy who at this stage of his career, you know, he's looking for certain matchups to really excite him. When you have that many fights, you know, motivation to really train as hard as you possibly can isn't as easy as it is, you know, when you're at my stage of the career. It's just a fact. So, you know, I think overall the, the matchup just didn't excite him that much. You know, he looked at it and was like, oh, you know, I don't think I have anything to gain from fighting Brian Stan. And, um, we have a lot of respect for each other, so he just, that wasn't the fight he wanted to take. Not to mention, he didn't know his timeline, when he was going to be capable of training and capable of fighting again. And he didn't want to have, you know, me waiting around just to fight him until, you know, late summer. So... I didn't take any insult to it, and, you know, in turn, I really ended up getting a better fight for myself. Um, Vanderlei Silva is not ranked in the top ten right now, and George Santiago is in everybody's top ten ranking, and he has been for two years. So, you know, I have a situation where I have much more to gain from this fight than I would having fought Vanderlei Silva. Brian Stan is my guest. He'll be in action Saturday night on pay-per-view, taking on Jorge Santiago at UFC 130. You know, Brian, uh, of course, originally this uh, card was supposed to be headlined by the third in the trilogy of uh, Frankie Edgar defending his lightweight title against Gray Maynard. Both those guys come up injured, so they're off the card. I have noticed as a longtime UFC observer that whenever there is this type of cancellation near the, 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 uh, the top of the card, that one silver lining is it does seem like it sort of opens up the card to be any any two fighters fight of the night possibility. Um, does that sort of thing, you know, go through your head when it's not so much about the the one main event matchup anymore and it kind of opens up the field? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the fighters in this card, um, when that happened, you know, you, there's a little bit of disappointment because I really enjoy fighting on the same card as Frankie. Um but, yeah, I mean, it does really open the door for younger fighters like myself who are less known and, and guys like George Santiago to really put on a performance and be showcased and be the fight that the next day everybody was talking about. Because it's difficult to do that. When you're not the title fight, you know, the day after, everybody's talking about that fight. Specifically, Edgar Maynard 1 was just, or 2, was an amazing fight. Mm-hmm. So I think it's definitely opened the door for fights like mine and George Santiago for a lot of the story. Um, you know, for, for fights like those to really steal the show. I noticed that uh, you, you posted on your Twitter that the UFC had changed your flight to Vegas because Jorge Santiago was, was on the flight. I guess that sort of thing is customary. Does that, does that matter to you? Would it, would it really bother you if uh, you guys were, were on the uh, – probably sitting together might be a little odd, but uh, being on the same plane, does that matter to you? Not at all. Not at all. Not for me. I mean, I could have sat next to him on the plane. I don't care. Yeah. You know, this isn't personal. <laughs> Yeah. This, is, this yeah. is an athletic competition. It's no different if I'm going to go out with 
backyard and play one on one basketball with somebody. Yeah, I'm a very competitive guy and I always try and win. So, you know, uh, everything I've seen and heard from George Santiago is very respectable. And he seems like a that can end up being given that he would become one of my friends. And uh, we, we could be, you know, training partners, but it's just not the case. And, you know, we're going to compete on each other Saturday night. But when we lose or draw, we're not going to hold against each other. I think we're both top level sportsmen, and it's going to be a very respectful, very exciting fight. And afterwards, we'll have even more respect for each other. Brian, I, I didn't want to let you go without asking you about your continued work with uh, the troops. And, you know, I, I think there's a very important component to this because uh, while, you know, uh, I, I think lots of people talk about being uh, supportive of uh, the troops when they are in the field of battle, there's never nearly enough focus on helping them once they return, um, not only physically from injuries. I mean, I think like uh, advances in body armor, for example, I mean, fortunately are enabling people who are wounded in battle to, 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 to live, uh, to survive some wounds that they might not have otherwise survived in generations past. But that does mean that there are additional medical challenges and then psychological challenges as well, uh, to say the least. And uh, you're you're very involved in that. And I kind of wanted to ask you to talk about that for a second about you know helping uh, helping the troops once they return home and some of the challenges they go through. Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest problems our troops face when they get out of the military is finding a job and being a factor. Um, you know, unfortunately, the economy is poor. But uh, most employers tend to veer towards what they're most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have familiarity with the military, a lot of times, you know, our war veterans, our, our, our military veterans get the last place in line for these jobs when they deserve the first one. And, and I'm very devoted to that cause. I'm the president of an organization called Higher Heroes USA, which is the premier employee assistance and transition assistance organization in the country. And we've partnered with organizations like the USL, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, to do a myriad of different things that help these veterans find jobs and get their military, specifically teaching them the skills they need to create resumes, um, how to interview correctly, how to quantify and communicate their skill sets to some main employers. And then we match them up with companies that have raised their hands saying, yes, yeah, you know, I do believe in these skills that these veterans have. I do want these men and women because... Let's face it, these men and women are imbued with skills. You can't learn anywhere else. You can't tell me that a college graduate from don't care what institution is imbued with the same level of honor, courage, and commitment or has showcased it in a theater like these men and women have, which is the most difficult, complex, and horrible theater known to man, and that's combat. So, um, you know, this Memorial Day, we have our own campaign taking place, actually, where the Call of Duty endowment is going to donate $50,000 to my organization, Hunter Heroes USA. And they're going to donate $1 for every Facebook status donation people will make. So people don't have to donate any money. They just need to go to the Call of Duty and all their Facebook page and donate their status to this awareness, to this cause. And for every time a person does that, Hire Heroes USA will get a dollar up to fifty thousand dollars, and that's actually starting today. Very nice, and you can follow him on Twitter as well at Hire Heroes USA. You can follow Brian on Twitter at uh, Brian Stan. You never know when he's going to run into one of the nasty boys on a uh, Vegas uh, 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 shuttle, so he'll tweet you a picture of that. And uh, also, <laughs> <laughs> BrianStan.com. I got you know it's funny. I read that. I saw the picture before I read the caption. And I just thought from the back, I said, I don't know what it means to me about uh, my love of pro wrestling as a little kid, but w the fact that I can still recognize Brian Knobs from the back uh, is uh, telling. But I guess you did, too. So uh, maybe <laughs> maybe we have that in common. Uh, Absolutely, immediately. Uh, Brian, listen, thanks so much for the time uh, taking on Jorge Santiago this Saturday night. I think this one's got fight of the night potential written all over it live on pay-per-view at uh, UFC 130. Uh, Brian, it's been a pleasure. Good luck in uh, the Octagon Saturday night. We'll look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Take care.